Hi. Thank you for that wonderful, wonderful introduction. That's absolutely gives me a warm feeling to be here today with everybody. Um, in fact, actually, the first person I ever saw talk myself was Rumi, so this is like full circle kind of thing over the last decade. And, um, ooh, oh, I've got to turn this on. Sorry, sorry. This little clicker works when I turn it on. Hi, um, so I'm Charlie. Hello. Um, you might be wondering who I am, and that's an okay question to ask, because I'm not actually that online anymore. I'm one of these people who's kind of retreated into the offline, into the woods uh, somewhere. But I've, I've been in this industry for about 20 years now. 20 years. I've been orbiting around it. I've been doing different things, and I've kind of landed back in the web development world now. And as you can tell from my beautiful and enunciated accent, I am actually British. I'm from here. Um, but I'm also one of those British people who like, really likes Europe. Um, so that's why, I know, harsh. Um, that's why I live in Berlin. I escaped early before the mad rush started. Um, and Berlin is beautiful. It's amazing. And it's amazing because it's a really sophisticated city. It's a place that's got incredible food. This is the highest quality stuff you will ever get. It's a place of privacy and restraint. <laughs> mm -hmm. And in fact, it's incredibly stereotypically German, which is why I really, really, really like living there. And there in Berlin, I work for a company called Springer Nature. Um, again, you might not have heard about them, but they are, they are actually one of the largest scientific and academic publishers on the planet, which is quite a big deal. And they produce things like uh, Biomed Central and Scientific American and the eponymous journal Nature, which has itself been around since 1869, like 100 what, 60 years? Is that something like that? It's an enormous amount of time. And it is the most cited scientific journal on the planet. And it's used by scientists like these. These are all scientists, and I've researched that. This is true. Um, it's used by scientists like these to get their work seen by other scientists, which is a really big deal, no matter where they are in the world, no matter... Uh, what kind of like financial situation they're in, they can see the work that we produce. But I'm not here to talk to you about science. Not completely, anyway. I'm actually talk here to talk to you about something that was invented by a scientist. The single biggest invention in recent human history, invented by this lovely guy, Tim Berners-Lee, Sir Tim Berners-Lee. And he invented something called the web, which is, let's face it, a pretty stupid thing. And I don't mean that in a bad way, in a pejorative way. I mean that in the sense that the web is simple. It's a really, really simple bunch of technologies that have been put together. And I'm going to steal th some things here from Jeremy Keith. If anybody knows Jeremy Keith, he does a wonderful talk about how the web was invented and how it's made of layered technologies working together. So I've decided to take all of his work and steal it and compress it down into a little chunk here. Just a little brief history of the web. And it started with the telegraphs, you can arguably say. People know what the telegraphs are? You know, some of you very young people, you might not have used a telegraph. The things go beep, 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 like that, and you send signals down wires. Yeah, you know this kind of thing. Well, these things uh, sent those signals around the wires and they got upgraded into something called telephones because people figured out that, oh, we could use the same in infrastructure and we could add on top another layer of functionality. Isn't that fantastic? We just had to add some microphones and it worked in the same way. And the early computers were coming about during this kind of period in the 50s and 60s and they wanted to talk to each other. They wanted to get on board with this human concept of arguing down a telephone. They wanted to have their own discussions. So we had the familiar scream of the modem and we had things like uh, the movie War Games occur. Those are pretty much summing up what happened there. That was true, that's all true, that's a documentary that film is. 
And so we invented things like uh, network standards to allow them to talk together in a consistent way. TCP and UDP and IP all working together to allow common communication standards. And those networks talking together form something greater. They form something called the interconnected network, the internet, the foundation of everything else that we built on top of. We built application protocols, we invented those because we needed common ways of dealing with certain situations. Things like email and SSH and FTP, things we use every day today. And we figured out ways of communicating and addressing these things. We had common uniform resource locators. So we had things like, uh, we have web addresses and email, and we just knew how to send messages to each other. And then finally, on top of all these things, we had something called HTML, hypertext markup language, itself running on top of one of those application protocols, something called HTTP, hypertext transfer protocol. This here was taken in Vienna when I visited there and I saw they had a photo of the, the first document, the certim put out to his supervisor, where his supervisor says, mm, it's kind of exciting, you know, completely underestimating what the web was going to be in the future. And I talk about all of this just to emphasize the point that the web is so incredibly strong. We never stop to appreciate that, do we? It's strong because of that simplicity because of all those simple technologies working together, layered on top of one another. Especially HTML itself. HTML is kind of like this declarative language. You might have heard that said so often, oh, HTML is a declarative language. But what does that mean? Well, to me, that means it's, um, it's a little bit flirty, you know? HTML likes to call up the browser late at night and say things like, I've been thinking about you. Yeah, maybe we, could, um, maybe we could get some paragraphs, you know, onto the page. Maybe we should get some headers up there, you know? And the browser's all like, well, okay, I'll make that happen for you. And it flirt, they flirt with each other. They never actually explicitly say, I want you to do this and I want you to put that there. They just give a vague request to each other and it works. And this makes HTML so incredibly strong, it's unbelievable. You can pull a page apart as it is running. You can pull chunks of code out of a living document. And at the end of it, you will still be able to use the remaining items on the page and go to the next section. How amazing is that? We just take that for granted. That is incredible. And that's the reason why the web is everywhere today, why it permeates our lives. It dominates because of that robustness. Some kind of very strict language, an imperative language, would have fallen over and died in the kind of conditions the web was born in and still exists in today. HTML was flexible, and so it adapted and grew quickly. And that meant that the early web was a really bizarre and weird place. Because anyone could publish whatever they wanted onto the web. Whatever weird thoughts that they had in there, they could get them out. Maybe it was cheaper than therapy, I don't know, but the web was a good place back then. You could declare your love for whatever superstars you, were, you cared for. If you were a struggling author, you could get your first web page up there. And if you were a plucky little startup, you could try and see if this web thing would work out and if you could make a business from it. They did make a business from it, yes. The early web was incredible. But, I'm going to say that a lot in this, but things kind of changed after a while. And what used to be free and weird 
kind of became balkanized and locked in, became commercialized. And I don't know if any of you are old enough to remember this stuff. If any of you were the distinguished years that I am, you might be able to remember these kind of things. At one point, the web got split between these two browsers, Netscape Navigator and Internet Explorer. And devs had to choose which one they were going to build for. Their JavaScript would not work on one or the other. They had to choose which one, maybe maintain two versions at once. And users had to kind of pick their loyalty to browsers. And it's not weird to think about that now. It was a time of the browser wars. And it sucked because all innovation in the web sphere died at that point. It was a really crappy time in the industry, I think it's fair to say. For a long time, nothing happened. No, no change occurred in the web. No innovations were made. Huge numbers of people just left the industry then and pursued other things. But at some point, history restarted. And it came in the form of this little thing. The first iPhone. And I'm not some kind of Apple lover, you know, I'm, I'm using a lovely Mac up here on the stage, but you know, let's be fair, I stole that from somebody. <laughs> I'm not giving it back. Um, I'm not an Apple lover, like I say, but the first iPhone was a gift. Not because it was the first smartphone or the first device of that nature, but because it was the first popular one. And it was our first great lesson in diversity. Because up until then, we'd been assuming that everybody had to design for one of two browsers. And then suddenly, this weird little device came along with a completely different input mechanism, a completely different screen size, and a completely different network connection. It blew our tiny developers' minds. And so we had to learn things like responsive web design because we didn't want to exclude people. We didn't want some people not to be able to use our sites. And so we learned, we produced things like uh, progressive web design and we learned about the separation of concerns. And we had things like this, which is the pyramid of robustness. We can actually see it here, it's on screen. Where we put the most heavy duty things, the things most capable of taking the weight at the bottom. And then we layered on top the things that were maybe a little weaker each time, a little more brittle. So we, like, we had the table at the bottom and on top, we stacked on top the beautiful, delicate vase. Yeah? It was a lovely, lovely stack of things going on, layered on top of each other. And this whole thing served the web incredibly well. And in fact, I think it's fair to say that it was the web summer of love, you know? We embraced diversity. We embraced all the different things that were out there. It was a little bit hippy-dippy. It was a little bit great. It was like, hey, man, this is amazing, you know? Let's just all love each other, you know? Let's just love each other. The web summer of love. But, again, but, are we starting to start that cycle again, you know? Maybe with different technologies and in different ways, but with the same results that we are now choosing to exclude people from the web. We got, we've got to the point where the average web page size is, what was it, about two megabytes? 2.5 depends on who you listen to. In fact, we, this was a few years ago, I think, we got to this point. Basic information sites, not video, not some kind of weird interactive app, but the basic website now is this size. You might be like, whatever, Charlie, whatever, Grandma, two, two megabytes, Boom, that's nothing. Woo, I eat two megabytes, that's, that's nothing. But performance is now a real problem on site. And we know things like this. We know 53% of users will abandon a site that takes more than three seconds to load. We know that as fact. Google did that, they researched that. And yet, the average load time on a 3G connection, which most people are using in some way or another, is 12 seconds. How do we reconcile that in our heads? What's that about? And you might be like, oh, whatever, Charlie, come on, Grandma, seriously. 
that's on mobile devices. Nobody cares about that. It's all about the desktop machines. It's all about my fiber connection. It's all about my iMac and my New York apartment. It's all about that. Well, is it? I mean, because guess what connections most people in, say, developing markets are? The next billion people coming online, lots of people talk about this, are on this. That's a Moto G4. That is the most average phone on the planet. A low CPU, high latency connection device. Really low end, really crappy. And you might be again, okay, well, whatever going on, you know, I don't care about that. Let's face it, that's about the Indians and the Chinese, isn't it? I don't care about them. You're like, well, okay, hypothetical racist person, you know. You should <laughs> care about them. You absolutely should be caring about them. But even if you're not, you know, even if you take your big dollop of racism and you say, so what? It turns out places like the USA actually have this. If you go outside a major metropolitan area, 50% of the USA is on a 3G connection. In the USA. In fact, I heard a statistic that something like if you go into the rural USA and look at landline connections, most of the rural USA is on dial-up. I don't mean broadband, I mean dial-up. 56 kilobits a second connection is the average. And even if you ignore things like performance and stuff, we're still really terrible at things, aren't we? Look at things like accessibility. Most people haven't got a clue about it. Somehow, this is not the, the top-rated item on a developer's CV. How is that not the case? How is this not a core requirement of being a web developer? And, if anybody knows me, you know where this is going. And we've got to the point where JavaScript has been seen is the default delivery mechanism for pages. Just to deliver HTML. And I suppose some people would say, you know, permission to rant at this point and feel a little bit apologetic about it. But I've kind of got beyond that point now. And I don't care. This is my talk and I can say what the fuck I like about this stuff. <laughs> so to me, things like this, building JavaScript first, it's like building your own home-built flying car, you know? You order all those components from overseas. You put them together. You test fly this little vehicle and then say, I'm going to commute to work in this. This is the best thing ever. I'm going to commute to work in it. I'm going to fly over there. And you get up in this car, you take it down your road, you fly up into the air and you land two kilometers away. Now, that's amazing. That's technologically wonderful. And I applaud you for that. Well done. Well done. That is actually a genuine, amazing thing to do. But wouldn't it have been better to buy a fucking bicycle? <laughs> Seriously. We tend to massively, massively over-engineer things now. In fact, I'd say we're building the sites that we want to use, not the sites that users want to use. And in case you think I'm talking smack about JavaScript here, please, 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 don't even think that for a second. I don't say that you can do progressive enhancement and all these amazing, like, server-side generated things and make them better for things like this. I don't mean that for some of the advanced apps that we have nowadays that rely exclusively on client-side animation. I'm talking about content sites content-driven sites, which is what 99% of the web is about. Now, I don't know if that's a real number or not. I've pulled it out of my ass. <laughs> but it feels right, doesn't it? It feels absolutely true. Because collectively, we've got this kind of peer pressure, this FOMO thing going on, haven't we? Where it feels like everybody is building a single-page application. 
And everybody's like, oh God, I haven't learned Vue this, this month. I, have, I don't know about the latest reactive elements. I haven't used this latest technique that somebody's talking about on their blog post. And people, we're freaking out. We're kind of like, I don't know what's going on. Everybody's doing this. But it turns out it's not true, really. Look at this here. This is the top 15 websites on the internet, on the web. And the vast majority of them, they're all content sites, text, images, and video delivered from the server to the browser. Sites, not applications. I don't care about this whole fucking spectrum thing. These are sites. Yes, even YouTube, even Twitter, even Facebook. They are content delivery sites. Let's face it, we spend most of our time scrolling down the page and reading, don't we? We're just con consuming animals for this kind of thing. And it's led to this awful situation now where things that were robust and strong are suddenly now fragile as hell. They die easily. As soon as network connections are bad, as soon as it's a low powered device, as soon as the user blocks JavaScript for some way or for some reason, and yes, people do do that, as soon as advertising or extensions get in the way and cause scripts to fail, these sites are suddenly fragile. And it's led to the situation where we've We've turned that pyramid of robustness upside down and suddenly we've got the table at the top and we've put the delicate bars at the, bars at the bottom. What the hell is going on there? The thing that's most likely to shatter should not be at the bottom. I mean, I'm no engineer, but I know there's a reason why they did not build pyramids like this. <laughs> They are inherently unstable in this manner. I don't think we've found any upside down pyramids. I'm willing to ask an archeologist about that though. I will go back and check about that. Collectively, we've kind of got this new focus, haven't we? It's about tooling and packaging and build systems and ecosystems. And it's all about things that look good on our resumes. Users, has kind of disappeared from our language now. What's good for the user? It's not really something you hear nowadays. We're kind of back to the point where we're excluding people again, where we've chosen to explicitly say, you and you and you, you cannot use my website. You are not good enough. How awful is that? How terrible. All because we want to have our fun with technology. Well, maybe this is a bit negative. I do get accused of being negative sometimes. That's how I am. I'm a negative Nelly. So what can we do that's positive? What can we do to stop this kind of cycle from happening? How can we make the web better? I think there's a lot we can do. And the first thing I would say is that we can slow down, really slow down, because we have a tendency to think like this, to move fast and to break things. And I know, I know that's not Facebook's motto anymore. They kind of learned to do the PR thing, but we still tend to follow them, don't we? Companies like Facebook, we go, they're great, let's do what they do. Why the hell do we do that? Facebook has almost broken Western democracy. Facebook, really seriously, has been complicit in a genocide in Myanmar. What the fuck are we doing listening to companies like this? This is foolish. I get a little bit angry at this point. Sorry about this, people. How about this instead? How about we do things like move at an appropriate speed and make things work. What the fuck is wrong with that? Yeah? I mean, when I say this kind of thing, some people get really angry and they're kind of going, you, ca you can't do that, Charlie. You can't, you're not allowed to do that. That's not agile. You have to move fast and you have to break things. 
Twitch, see, what, what, what the hell are you on about? Of course it's not. This is, in fact, the essence of agility to make things work. Agility is about producing working products at the end of each one of your sprints. But how often do we do that? How often do we have a working, launchable product at the end of every sprint? Never. We go for big bang releases still, don't we? Despite all this talk of things like agility. Agility should be reflecting those layers of the pyramid, finding out those things that work, making it work, and then adding on top gradually. Get something out there, make it better, refine it, bring it into focus. But no, we go for complexity from the start now, don't we? What's the most advanced technology I can use? Great, I'm doing that. I'm working backwards from there. And I think we've got to recognise that we've got this focus on coding as some kind of god almost, you know? Because we put code on a pedestal and we put ourselves coders on a pedestal. And we say things like, rock star developers, 10 times engineers, JavaScript ninja, things like that. It's ridiculous that we think in this way, that we hype ourselves up. And maybe we should be thinking about other areas of our industry and how we can integrate them more into our lives. About UX, about design, about QA. For example, with UX, we, why the hell aren't we researching more with them? We've heard this, we've touched on this in other talks about how we should take the time to do research and find out how things work initially, what users actually want. Instead of, again, jumping in with a tech-based decision, like, I want to use the latest framework. I just want to make it work, man. Mm -mm -mm. How about finding what's useful for users? Because it could be they want almost nothing, and that would do it for them. And you could launch and make something work straight away. We've got to get rid of this concept of just code something and hope it works. Because to me, it feels like throwing paint at a wall, you know? Throwing a huge lump of paint at a wall and hoping magically a Picasso or a Monet will be left behind when the paint drips away. Tech has kind of become our master in this and we jump at technology as the first thing. I think we've also got to recognise what the web is. We've got to recognise the heterozygous nature of the web. Because we have this claim that the web, is a, the web is a platform now, isn't it? We keep seeing this. The web is a platform. But what's a platform? A platform is a set of known conditions, a set of known APIs and a known situations where it's used. It's something like the App Store, a controlled environment. Yet the web is not that. The web is bonkers and chaos and just all these kind of swirly things going on. It's a million different platforms. It's a million different screen sizes. It's a million different interfaces. It's a million different users. All of them mixed together into something that's almost infinite in scope. And we're expected to treat that as a platform? Uh-uh, not going to happen. And I don't want to dismiss it. I don't want to just dismiss this whole thing. I want us to embrace it and to incorporate it, just to say this is a constraint that we operate in, that the web is chaotic, and just acknowledge that from the start. So I think we need to cultivate a little bit of simplicity to actually achieve this, because we're the, we're the only industry that kind of craves complexity, you know? We're really weird in that notion. Scientists, engineers, architects, anything like that, they want to make things simpler at every opportunity. They want to make things easy to go from the start. Us? Uh-uh. We want our build systems. We want our complex things. We want to make things harder and harder for ourselves, raise that entry point constantly. These other industries, things like science and engineering and things like that, they've recognised that simple things survive. Simple things are robust and get through any kind of environment. 
Maybe we need to start using things more like the rule of least power. This is something I only heard of a few months ago. The rule of least power. You know what that is? That says, if something can be built with a technology lower down in the tech stack, then it should be built with a technology lower down in the tech stack. I think that's an amazing, an amazing point of view to have and one that could actually help our industry so much to do so more to make things that work for other people. I think so well, we've got to do things like designing progressively as well. And by that, I don't mean to make things just simple and ugly and only work in the most basic way. I'm talking about taking an approach where we do things from the most simple first approach and build upwards from there. It means only doing as much as is needed. So for example, I say this, this is from my workplace. This is something that we test with users. This, it's just a HTML page rendered on the server and sent to the client. Do you know why we do this? We do this to make sure that this is what the users want, that this is a content that they want, that this is something that they can navigate around. It takes two minutes to produce a HTML page. So we just throw these things together and check if it works for them. And then and only then do we start doing things like adding simple CSS on top and then adding more complex CSS once we've confirmed some of these, con um, some of these concepts and then adding on top advanced JavaScript and loading them into place. We do this all the time and it works so well. And by doing this, we make sites that work for 100% of users. And I mean that, even somebody who visited us in their Internet Explorer 5.5 powered time machine, they would be able to use our sites. And we use really simple techniques to do that. Like this media query. All this does is capture the latest browsers. That captures all modern browsers. Really simple one to do. The older ones, we just give that simple bit of HTML to. The modern ones, we send everything to, because with sending this CSS, we can also attach JavaScript to that. We can do a check using the match media method, just to say, did that CSS pass? Great, fantastic, let's load all the advanced JavaScript as well. And this means we have pages that work in the worst network conditions, in the most hostile environments. For people who were in sub-Saharan Africa, running effectively off a, two, off a feature phone. They can tether to their computer. It can still work just as well as it can for the rich person somewhere in downtown New York. We're proud of that. We're proud that our sites work in that way. And because I'm kind of like, really like this company I work for and want to plug them, I'm going to say, go and Google or use your search engine of choice and look for this phrase. Spring and Nature front-end playbook where we document all of these things. And you can go and just get a free helping of how to achieve working in this way. It's really, really useful. We also need to stop assuming the happy path for everything, which is something we do in all kinds of things, not just as developers and designers, but everybody. We kind of assume that the best thing will happen every single time. But the real world is not a happy place, is it? You know, we've all been there. We know the shit that can happen. My, uh, my German colleagues have a lovely phrase for this. Das Leben ist kein Ponyhof. <laughs> Life is not a field of ponies. <laughs> Quite a beautiful phrase in the German language there, surprisingly. <laughs> we need to start using our products as real people do in these weird and hard situations that they operate in. And we've got to stop considering those times when our technology fails as being some kind of edge case for people. Because people are not edge cases. People are not edge cases. I really want to drive this home. Your technology can suffer an edge case. But what that does is produce a stress case 
for a human every single time. Why aren't we doing things like using screen readers every single day in our lives? Do you do that out there? Because you really, really, really need to be. Because this is what real people use. We really, really all need to be using the keyboard every single day. Do you do that? Because there's people out there every day who are forced to and don't have the choice. And they need your sight to work in that way for them. Do you test with real hardware? I know it's all very easy to go and use browser stack and use virtual machines. But how often have you tested your website on a phone with a cracked screen? How often do you take your website out into the real world and use it in direct sunlight? How often do you use it just with a pair of gloves on or some such? These things are really important. These are real people using your site in those ways. And you might say, ah, Charlie, I'm not interested. Sorry, sorry, Grandma, I'm not interested. That's not what we do, really. Sorry. And I would say to you, and this is perhaps controversial now, but if this is your attitude, if you don't want to deal with people in the browser, go away. Stop being a front-end developer because that is your job. That is what being a front-end dev is about. It's about caring for people. It's not about the code. It's about how does it work for people each and every time. And yes, that's idealistic, but I'm at the point in my career where I'm pissed off with this and I want things to change. We've got to be better at this. So, in summary, I sum this up. The web is strong because it is robust. And its robustness comes from simplicity. Those simple technologies led on top of each other, working together. And the web is therefore become indispensable for everybody on the planet because it had gone out there and become ubiquitous. So let's start defending the web a bit more and let's start defending people a bit more. Because at the end of the day, it's not about us. It's about them. Thank you. <laughs>